Yes, so I'm standing here to talk about the debug information we currently uh, emit when you use LTO and how we can or should improve it and what's the motivation to do so. And I'm actually registered this talk to force myself to work on it again because I was working on it last year and the year before. And I, I never got it into some shape where it's even in a possible shape to get it merged for the next release. So hopefully this time. So maybe we will see it in some form in GCC 7. So what's the status currently? Currently, um, if you, it somehow wraps. Hmm. How much is messing? It's just uh, three letters. Can you, can I, I guess uh, I'm telling you anyway what's on the slide. So I hopefully nothing important on my fancy drawn images is missing. Uh, so currently, if you use LTO, you probably don't want to debug the thing anyway, because debugging optimized code is, well, it's not a pleasant experience. But then we all have products and customers, and they run into issues with our optimized code. So there are enough times where you do have to sit down and debug optimized code. And it works now pretty well if you do not use LTO. If you have C or C++ code at least, which I'm used to debugging, uh, then it's possible to do a regular debugging session. And if you know the CPU and can read some assembly and do some reverse execution in your head, then you can get quite far. <laughs> but now, if you use LTO, um, it wasn't so bad until everybody started to use non-C, which is like even GCC now uses C++. Uh, because with LTO, generally, the, the kind of debug if information, um, so when I, when I talk about debug information, I always implicitly talk about dwarf, because this is the only debug format that matters, right? <laughs> because in, in steps, everything looks like C. Or Objective-C, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I'm talking about Dwarf only. Uh, so if you use LTO currently, it mostly appears like you're debugging a C program, which can be quite awkward if you are debugging a C++ code base with classes and methods and whatever, because you can't even put breakpoints on things like a method in, an, in a class, because you, you, you have to do it by the mangled name for example. Um, so the dwarf actually has encoded that this, this object came originally from a C++ source, but it doesn't seem to help the debugger very much. It, it mostly guides it as how, uh, what expressions it accepts. If you would like do uh, like a print A plus B, then it expects, uh, it accepts, it, it automatically switches in C++ mode, basically. This is what the effect seems to be. Um, and, and the reason for this is uh, that we currently emit the dwarf from the very late stage of the compilation, which means in case of LTO, the, the link time optimization step, where of course we have mixed all input languages, did cross language inlining and whatever, threw away all the types, all, yeah, well, basically everything interesting that was there to create the debug information in the first place. So you get the locations for declarations, but you miss all the interesting dwarf about the types, the connection between uh, virtual tables and types. So everything that would help the, con the dwarf consumer to give you a pleasant debug experience. This means, for example, that the uh, uh, Lipsana C++ pretty printers don't work at all. They just crash in the Python code because unexpected things happen. So they somehow know was this is supposed to be a standard string, but all fields that are supposed to be there are not there, at least not in the dwarf. And as I already uh, told you, setting breakpoints on anything that's not a, a global function or maybe a function in a namespace, this is also kind of working, uh, is, is difficult. And more so if you, if you uh, emit G, G3 debug information, you're expecting uh, macro, uh, debug information for the macros. But that's, of course, something that's completely lost at 
the, the link time optimization stage because there is no, uh, nothing from uh, left from the preprocessing stage. So all the, the, the very interesting location stuff is lost. And I, yeah. So the motivation is to fix this. And yeah. So what's, what's the idea? Uh, I think last year or the, late the year before, Eldi talked about early debug. I don't know if he, if he did a presentation on it. I don't remember exactly. But uh, he, he worked on uh, merging the early debug work, which means uh, separating our dwarf backend into two stages. Uh, first, creating dice uh, for all the declarations and types. And in the second phase, generate, annotate them with locations. Like in the late compilation, annotate them with the locations where which register is available currently, li currently live, stuff like that. And the types and declaration dice are created when basically the front end is still somehow in control. It's actually uh, at the moment done via debug hooks that are uh, invoked in between the front end running and the, the, gimple, the gimple lowering ending. So the gimple lowering ending point is where we actually say, well, we are now finished with the early, with the early dwarf. So this is where we still have all the information left. So what is the idea? Yeah, some letters are missing, but well. So the, the idea is that for LTO, we are leveraging the, the work done for early debug and basically output this early dwarf tree into the compile time early debug because this happens when we compile the original files and in the end we'll output the LTO intermediate language into the object file. At the same time, we output uh, the dwarf we, ca we have generated uh, up to that point. So we have uh, many units which have the, the just single compilation unit stuff like uh, the compile unit tag, subprograms, variables, types, and whatever. They all have no location, so they appear like if they are kind of abstract instances. If you maybe are familiar with Dwarf, uh, then you know, like for inlining, people usually use abstract instances for the original function, so not repeat it for each inlined instance, and you can refer back for each inlined instance to this abstract instance to, to save some dwarf. Uh, then on the late phase, this happens at the, the LTRANS time. This is basically the, the link time optimization unit piece. We are, so we, we are splitting, um, I guess I shortly say two sentences again about how LTO works. <laughs> so <laughs> because it may be missing to some, of, uh, some people of you. So we, we have the compile time where we generate for each source translation unit an object with LTO bytecode. Then we have the VPA stage, which is missing here. It's the whole program analysis phase, which basically reads all uh, the intermediate, uh, intermediate bytecode, merges it somehow, and then splits it into a set of units that are then link time optimized, just to make this thing more scalable. Uh, so at for each of this units that is now optimized at link time, we generate debug information that just contains the locations for those, uh, for, the, for the dice we created early, for like the variable or the subprogram. For the subprogram, we have the low PC, high PC. For the variables, you usually have uh, a location attribute. And we refer to the early generated dice by, uh, from, from this dwarf unit for the link time optimization granular th uh, unit, import all the units that are part of this link time unit, and that are uh, not necessarily all of them. I guess, I don't know how likely it is, maybe Honza knows so how, how the distribution of compile time units to link time units is, if it's really every unit is in every Eltrans unit in somehow, in some way or not. I guess one would need to do some statistics on how our partitioning works. Oh, I somehow shipped over. Okay, back. 
I did. Yeah, maybe. Ah. No. No, it works again. Um, so we refer to the unit, and each of the late die simply refers to one of the early created dies via the, an AppSec origin. Later, uh, the, the, the link editor will combine them all together into one debug information thing again. So this is the idea. I have another fancy picture that only misses the, the final object on the right side. So basically, we have these compile time object files, which contain the LTO bytecode and the early debug information sections. So it's basically just regular ELF sections with debug info, debug abrif, debug string, whatever. They're actually prefixed with .lto, whatever, because we also have the fat objects, so you can have two sets of debug information in those units, but leave that on the side. Um, then at the VPA stage, we split the, the debug out into object files so that then just contain the debug information from the compile unit and now with correctly named sections and uh, just partially link them into one combined thing. This is to, yeah, it, it's, it can reduce the load on the, the linker, on the final link. Unfortunately, the partial, partial link doesn't optimize the, the string tables, it doesn't merge them, so they are actually getting quite large because, of course, with C++ and very many includes, you have a lot of redundant string stuff and the partial link will just concatenate it. Well, I guess one could fix the linker to do the string merging here. And the VPA stage will generate these LTRANS units with uh, combined LTO bytecode. Those will then com be compiled by the LTRANS stage. This early debug just skips this phase and it, it will generate the, the late dwarf sections. And the final link step will then combine the early debug object and the LTRANS objects, where the LTRANS late LTO annotates this early blob. So how does it actually work? The, like referring back to dice in some other object file? Well, of course, at compile time we simply emit a symbol at the start of dot debug info, so we can have uh, uh, so, so we can have relocations to symbol plus plus offset uh, from the, the late dwarf into the respective early die, and then we need to stream the relation of we have a decal where's the early die in, so we have a symbol plus an offset per decal we stream in the LTO IL. So this is where we somehow uh, keep track of where is the early die uh, for the delayed dwarf phase. So let's see what's the next. Ah, right, okay. So there's actually one kind of thing that, that looks a bit weird, which is the step where uh, I now extract the early debug into separate object files and then do a partial link. I, ideally, we could save all this I.O. and just make the linker plugin handle that we only claim uh, the LTO bytecode part of the object file and leave the early debug for the final link. I, it, it somehow works with GNU LD if you feed it back a, a linker script. It doesn't work exactly 100%ly <laughs> and it doesn't work with, uh, with goal at all. And well, due to all these facts and that the fact that uh, if I start to refactor the dwarf code so that it works with the scheme, the, the, the way LTO works right now breaks in subtle ways, so I can't really have both modes. I need some way to have old tool chains cope with this, and this is introducing this uh, awkward scheme where I just extended the simple object interface to do this a split out renaming part and uh, for the combining I just use the, the linker that's currently available. So it's just like for the backward compa compatibility and ideally we, we would get a linker plugin API extension that allows for this to work more efficient. But uh, I didn't work on this yet. I also 
only worked on the ELF side for the simple object and not on the XCOF and COF and MACHO parts. I guess COF and XCOF are easy, but MACHO will uh, <laughs> going to be interesting. And, and David told me XCOF uh, isn't needed anyway because LTO doesn't work on, on AIX. But yeah. So this, this part would be unnecessary, ideally. So what's the result? Um, I've during the development, I did lots of testing, basically running the whole test suite with uh, LTO and minus G and compare the previous state to the next state. The previous state is pretty broken because if you just add LTO and G to random test cases, they start to break in interesting ways. They scan the assembly, which doesn't generally work if you use LTO and stuff like that. So the only way is to really diff the result and look for the differences, not really for the fails because, well, there are plenty of fails if you do this. Some of them we even should fix, but yeah. Uh, and the most interesting result is that uh, after the patch, all the C++ uh, printer printers start to work. Yeah. yeah. Which I actually basically means it works. It's, it basically means it works. Uh, of course, I think uh, all the printer printer work with O0 only, but then, I'm not sure if the pretty windows work generally if you have optimized code. <laughs> or, or, or what are the failure modes the, the Python code gives up if it just spits out the Python errors or if it does gracefully optimized out or something like that. I don't know. But uh, this, this, is a, this is what, I, what I'd like to see. There are also some ISIS gun that we should, fi should have fixed anyway. So like in libgomp there are currently quite a few ISIS uh, if you compile the test cases with F LTO minus G, I guess we just didn't keep attention and we somehow bit rotted somewhere or broke something. The, the LTO testing, especially with debug in the test suite, isn't very, isn't very sophisticated. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, success. So this is actually one, one of the side effects of uh, doing this is that some of the support tests uh, no longer work exactly like before if you just add minus FLTO minus G uh, because most of the tests, um, the, te the test suite parts at minus FET LTO, this is, uh, Honza added this to make the, the scan assembler work. So, so it's not really using the LTO, but it's then using the FET parts to scan the assembler. And with, with uh, LTO minus G, with the new way of doing it, you, like, uh, you get two copies of the dwarf. So all dwarf tests fail because they now have two times the debug information and are, uh, are doing scan assembler times. And well, they're all off by the factor of two now with the fat objects. And I, yeah, uh, or like they're scanning for um, the, if you, if you have tests that are not aware of any debug stuff, they are testing uh, this name doesn't appear in the assembly, but it now appears in the, debug, in the debug information because, well, the file name is just what you are looking for that doesn't exist. So, and uh, there are some of the support tests that are failing in, in some weird ways. So I, I didn't investigate that one, but it, I investigated one case in the, in the GCC DG and then decided, ah, let's not worry about the unsupported stuff. because they're also still, okay, so this test suite is actually pretty cle clean with uh, LTO minus G, it's only one fail. Interestingly, it's an execute fail, but well, it's pre-existing. So if, uh, for, the, for the other uh, test suites, there are a lot, of more, lot more unexpected fails anyway, due to all these kind of issues. So then, uh, Interesting numbers missing again. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should read them to you. Um, so uh, I think two days ago, Marcus posted on IRC some, some numbers about Firefox debug information size. If you now use the patched ver uh, variant versus the unpatched variant. So uh, with, the, with, with LTO, but not the new early LTO, 
uh, you get really, really small executables because there's almost no debug information. Uh, so now we, we regress there very much uh, with uh, the, the patch and uh, the debug size gets about the same size as if you don't use LTO. I guess that's expected. And it's also a success and not a regression. I hope so, at least. So I'm, I'm not really worried about the sizes. I, I've did a, a very small Hello World thing. It's not really interesting, uh, but you can see that the most of the debug information is, is from the early, from the early time. This is where all the types and everything is there. It's the includes and whatever. And if you look into the details, we are actually a bit more verbose than uh, with the non-LTO pass because the unused type pruning stuff um, with the patch happens now also early because late I can't prune anything from the, the objects I already emitted. And uh, at the point of the compilation, there's more stuff reachable for some reason. I didn't really debug why. So if you look at like the, the standard string type die, then there are all methods left with the LTO early debug. But if you use, uh, uh, if you look at the non-LTO variants, there are some of the methods are missing. I'm not sure how we prune them or why we do even prune them, but well, they are missing. So it's actually a little bit uh, bigger than, yeah, I guess the, this one is pretty, uh, not pretty uh, uninteresting apart from the size is comparable. So now for the Trams 3D, um, well, it's a very big piece early and about 10th of the size, no, it's, well, hex. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I made this slide uh, about uh, two hours before leaving for the flight. And uh, was running on the laptop, so it took quite some time to do LTO uh, Trams 3D on the laptop. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's um, oh yeah, and it's of course only one source unit, but multiple uh, link time units, right? So the... But it adds up to. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if I can make this smaller. It's pre it, I leave presentation oh, mode. Ah, well, no, this thing will no longer work, I guess. Um, yeah. So you see, there is something missing. I guess uh, if I add this up, it doesn't add up to this number. And. It's it's mostly from the from the location info. It's a lot less locations, right? It uh, this was O fast, so it was actually op optimized. This was O zero, um, and from from looking at not the Tram 3D case but other cases with the optimized case with LTO, we have sometimes a hard time keeping track of the debug for clones and stuff like that. And right and and Tram 3D is is kind of special because it has for for the final for one assembler of code you have like four or five function calls in in the source effectively. <coughs> <coughs> so this may be an an artifact that it's this extreme. Uh, when I looked at for an, an early iteration of the patch, I looked at the LTO bootstrap versus the regular bootstrapped CC1, and there the, the debug uh, information was about the same size, so also optimized, o O2 minus G with LTO and without LTO, um, and the locations were also a little bit less for, for the LTO, but, but not this much. So I guess it's, it's really the, the clones. And the clones have, I have a few more slides about issues. And clones are also some difficult issues with debug in general. For the locations, you, you really don't want to compare the size of the cover issues. Yeah, but uh, it was too late to, and I guess it's, it's a too big test case to do a meaningful comparison. Yeah. So we have the quality test suite. There are some imp tests improving, and there are a few regressing, which I will come to in one of the next slides. 
exactly. Okay, I test. Ah, it works. Okay. Versuch macht klug. Oh no, you see all my typos that are not typos. <laughs> so uh, what are the, the general issues with early debug? So with the dice we generate at early time, not, not necessarily only in the context of LTO, but especially if you emit this early die tree into a file and then attempt to reuse it at the final link time. This is uh, currently we are early generating quite a few locations, for example, for static initializers that are constant. We generally prefer to just use an address-based location to the actual variable because we expect it to be output into the read-only data section, for example. That's a lot more compact than like using dv at const value for a six kilobyte const uh, static initializer, which is constant, which is also possible. But yeah, so, uh, and the issue with that is that if we, if we do this early and we emit it into the object file, then we actually need that symbol we have output the relocation for at the late link time. But with LTO, we actually made up, uh, may end up uh, optimizing it away, even with non-LTO. But then we have the late dwarf phase, which runs over the whole dwarf tree, looking for references to uh, variables we have optimized out and just rips out the dice again, which of course we can't do in the late LTO phase because we already emitted this into a file. We could do it if you read that back in past the dwarf and yeah, but I try to avoid that. So, <coughs> and basically all of the issues are kind of of this kind. <coughs> For the, for the static initializers, if they are fully constant, of fully constant literals, then we can, of course, just gen early generate dv at const value. Like if you just have a, a static const int, we can do that. It's even more space efficient than using a relocation. I don't know if you, I, I think we even do this in some of the cases. Yeah, or something like, right, there's a late, there's a there is a in the in the C graph code that optimizes that removes the var pool node. There is a call into the the late uh, debug hook while still the early phase is in process to do this. I had to patch this out because it's a constraint violation. <coughs> well, what's the other possibility is to just uh, emit the thing only from the late phase and hope the initializer is still around. possible or well yeah the, the, the options are not not really many especially um, so the, the the fully literal constant case is, is the easy one because we have this 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 out even if it ex if it's uh, expensive and the initializer is very large but uh, we also have the symbolic constants like if you have <coughs> a constant address in the static initializer. There's no way to express this currently in Valve other than using a location. We can, you can use a location to, to put the address of A in this thing or use the address of P. But this are these are your, your two choices and both are of course bad because both P and A may be optimized away later in, uh, with LTO. So currently with the patch set, what I'm doing is I, I just don't emit these kind of uh, dice early because I can't get rid of them later. Um, yeah, I, I thought about for, this is all about like things optimized away or being still in the object file. So we might hand wave, well, this is a G uh, versus G zero issue that isn't really a code change. So we may just force the declaration to appear in the final object just for the sake of debug. This would be another way out, but of course the, this would be kind of some kind of change dependent on G minus G or not minus G. Yeah, well, you just just would declare the, the quest situation and say, okay, we don't have anything. Location optimized out. Yeah, so uh, at the moment, uh, what happens with, with my patch is 
uh, most of the time, as at the time we, we call the, the final uh, dwarf finish where we could annotate it. Ah, this happens if you don't, I'm not in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, LTO will have removed the, the static initializers, the decal initial uh, at some point, and I don't have it anymore to generate the dice from. So they're just gone at the moment. But there are several ways one can handle this situation, and I think even sensible ways. But uh, it's, it's not uh, the most complicated issue I've run into. Uh, most complicated, the more complicated case is if these uh, references to, to some symbolic objects happen, for example, in template parameters. Uh, we have some uh, one test case in the C++ test suite where we have a, f the a function value as template parameter. So the early die now has a template ID, whatever thing, which refers to the address of a function, which of course also can be optimized out. And I, I can't even annotate this thing late in LTO because LTO doesn't know anything about templates, right? So this, the dwarf has this uh, queue of to be annotated templates, but this is not directly encoded into the die tree. It's some on the site data structure, and I've not even started to th thinking about st streaming more than just references to dice, because this was the original design, and I just oh, I get through with that and not start inventing some workarounds, but just think about the issue in some in some more in some other way. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. So the the other issue I've run into with the duality is uh, variable size arrays, variable uh, variable length arrays. Um, they actually the, the the types of those arrays are actually context dependent. They're always local entities in C. Maybe Ada has global ones. Ooh. I hope so. Not. Um, so they are. Uh, in, in, in the type dice refer to some decals to specify like the upper bound of the array. Um, this makes it quite interesting to call this uh, something like an abstract instance of this type. Uh, and what happens currently, if we don't use LTO and anything and do inlining, we still have in the abstract instance uh, of the dice, we have this abstract VLA type with all the decals and type stuff there. And when we reuse it in a concrete instance for inlining, the inliner will, will, will and has to actually copy the type, deep copy the type, uh, and adjust the upper bound declaration that is used to, some to the copy of the declaration. So uh, our current dwarf backend will re-emit a copy of the, the whole type dice anyway. So the abstract instance is kind of useless. We probably could just strip it down some way. I, I, I think uh, it, it doesn't have the... It the reference, change your reference to die. Right. You have to mark anyway with some attribute the way what you did. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I convinced myself that the way I was trying to do it is which I... So I... I have the abstract copy in the early debug, and then in a concrete instance without inlining, uh, I was just referring to the die of the array decal, and referring to the die uh, which was associated with the upper bound, and annotated it with locations. But then there can be multiple copies of this thing, so it, it doesn't really work. I think somebody, I talked to somebody in, in a GDB bug I opened, and yeah, okay, I agreed with it. So in the current patch set, I, I'm arranging for the late phase to just re-emit the types. They are C-like, it works, because it currently also works with LTO. So I work around this a little bit. Um, but it's, of course, not, not really nice, right? And probably similar things happen with, I, I didn't even look at the Fortran array descriptor stuff, or Fortran strings, where it isn't even possible to refer to a die. Uh, probably multitude of ADA uh, variants. So th this is a very general issue that you have some 
some uh, local entity that is really a, a local type that is to interpret it in some other context. And the reinterpretation is in internally in GCC is, is just done by copying it and creating a variant of it and creating debug information for the whole variant. So what's, what's, what would be nice to have? Uh, so I thought, well, let's have a dwarf extension to deal with all this stuff. Uh, let's have a way to symbolically express stuff, like symbolically express, well, this is a static initializer that refers to the address of A, not put in a relocation to the symbol, but just have, this is the address of the object that is described by die, by this die, for example. Well, address of the die is the interface. It's, it's the location, right? No, no, the, the address of the interface is the address of the Okay, so we have that. Okay, so we can use this in the in the uh, in the const value attribute, for example. So this will be no, no, it's it's not exactly. Or or, or, or in, in, in in the location list uh, instead of instead of the instead of the instead of the. Ah, okay. So it, it has to be used by that. Yeah, well, yeah. it, it's it's. Yeah. Okay, so it's a f it's a final thing. Yeah. So the the other thing would also be would also be something like the final for for the case of the VLAs, which are where we have to deal with the context thing. Uh, basically, something that does something similar to to this or the implicit pointer. Just we are interested in the value. I, I'm not sure if it's really necessary to distinguish address and point and value, but some things or can have not an address but only have a value. So I'm not sure. For the value, there, there are the calls. Yeah. The calls, and it's my understanding of how it's supposed to work, is that basically it will be the guarantee that on the other side of it has a location. Yeah. But this is this is. If it's something without a location, or if it if it then. Well, it 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 it, 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 it would be some 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 not a thing thing and and the dwarf the, the dwarf expression evaluator the consumer would need to deal with not a thing or whatever. I guess it, it already has to deal with exceptions if you have a, an address that you can't dereference, for example. So like uh, LLDB I immediately crashes when I feed it the uh, debug information I generate, but I don't know. So I, I try to find other consumers to try to see what they are doing, but there's apparently only LLDB as free debugger left, and it's in a sorry state. Yeah, or I, I use uh, Retail, it's also a consumer. <laughs> it works fine on any dwarf, that is valid. <laughs> <laughs> it's similar. Yeah. So, so the the the, the second thing we which we could use for the VLA, where you have the AppSec instance with the the abstract upper bound variable. Um, if we if we refer to that, if we have in the location that where this abstract uh, die appears for the upper bound. If you use um, a dwarf op that says to the consumer, well, uh, the location is in, in this die, but please look in the, in the current bindings if there is a, 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 a concrete instance of this die and use that and use the location of that. So basically uh, m make it symbolic. So I, I, I thought about I just uh, use a string and do a really a name lookup, like the user would say print A. But then uh, the usually the upper bounds for our VLAs are artificial, 
things because they are created by the gamification of the sites. So it also should be a die then. Uh, so this would be, yeah, put the burden on the consumer because well the information is all there. It just needs to be told how to get to it. And the current wave is just using the abstract origins. Doesn't really tell it that uh, those are related in somehow, in some way. But yeah, so maybe there are some GDB people uh, which we can discuss this stuff a bit, or maybe we already have all the GNU extension ops for this. So the, the, the documentation on them is quite non-existing. Uh, did you also implement the documentation? <laughs> I only looked at uh, Dwarf for specs. So this, so this is this is more more like the, the split dwarf works, but this it split dwarf also works some in some weird way. I didn't really figure out how it's supposed to, to work. So actually, actually, the, the, the original files are the, are the only ones that have file the, the DVAD file, yeah, and but, but, but yeah. So 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 the, the the second the second extension for the VLA this could also be used for for non LTO and without early debug to to uh, make the debug info for the VLA shorter just by having it in in one instance in the AppSec instance and for the inline copies we we don't need to re uh, recreate type dies. Because one motivation for all the early debug is, where's the motivation slide? Ah, opportunities, huh? Opportunities. We just skipped it to do. <laughs> uh, one motivation is to be able to, at the point where we do the early finish, drop from Gimple most of all the type details and not be forced to like, copy the, the VLA type at all by inlining, not, not do the type copying in, by, uh, in the inlining. We are not really interested in the types because uh, the, the, the VLA type is only referred to by the decal original expression of whatever because we have lowered the VLAs into alloc A built-ins and pointer stuff anyway. And uh, we wouldn't need that information if you just can refer back to the, the original die and the, the symbolical location for the upper bound would still work just uh, so this is it's not really only for LTO it's something general because the idea of the early LTO is that we now then can finally start like doing freeing data unconditionally and try to strip down the memory we keep live doing the whole compilation just for the sake of the debug which should have happened with the early debug uh, Aldi did but if you if you did that at that point, then we've uh, broken the current LTO. So that the LTO was a blocker for that. For example, with the LTO patch now, I'm no longer in Dwarf Tower out doing the dance ar around this Dwarf Tower out abstract function, marking all decals as abstract, outputting dice again, and uh, because it's already there, it's the, the, the early dice are the abstract copy. So this the hook is basically empty now. It's just setting the this was inlined. 
on the thing. So this 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 enables this. Uh, so we we are going to run into all these LTO things for the non-LTO, and this is where we need to enhance the dwarf to keep things working. Yes, yeah. You have it in so multiple, yeah. You import all the original yeah. Conf files in all the Conf, all the parts in the compilation yeah. and the NPS and each giant word yeah. I mean, it, you, you actually will end up to d uh, with LTO due to the VPA uh, symbol and tree and decal merging. Uh, you will end up with, like, if you have in, in every source unit, import some inline function from some header, and you will only end up uh, inlining from one of these inline copies, even even in, in a function that is in, in uh, another unit, due to basically random which one is chosen as, as prevailing. So this... Yes. But uh, are you? Yeah. Selected item yeah. From that compilation unit. Yeah. But, but I, I'm 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 only annotating a few of them with locations. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think. think yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think just like if you use uh, the, the the types section for the for the dwarf, we can use the the link one stuff. It's good. Ah, finally. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's also like uh, with with the with the patch how it works now. In in the final debug, you have some kind of redundan redundancy uh, in there for the case where you didn't inline a function, because you still have the abstract copy and you have the copy that just annotates things. So it's not really the most space efficient way for the final object. So you could optimize the final dwarf tree in some way. There, you could also throw away not interesting early stuff that is duplicate. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, Jakob but it's like the, the dwarf set yeah, would <laughs> possibly do on, on my generated dwarf. So I, I, I wasn't even sure if I really need to import the unit because I could just add the this this the, the subroutine at as top level entity to my Ltrans thing and refer to the abstract. But uh, so I, I would I wanted to put it into context. Which one do I? Uh, so maybe it's not even necessary for the consumer, and I can just you uh, strip that one. Perhaps, perhaps that's better. I'm not sure. True, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, actually, it doesn't always have it, because if it's not early inlined, then it, it will not have the inlined flag, the abstract copy at the moment. So I, I, I was thinking about setting it always, but then if I never inlined it, the consumer may be confused again. So this is another detail that, that I can't annotate the function late. The, the, the abstract copy late with this was inlined. 
So I can't, it, it doesn't appear to make sense to add the attribute uh, this was inlined to the, uh, to the concrete instance. Because I, I can't really annotate the, the abstract copy. I can only create a, a concrete copy and inherit from the abstract copy. I can't really, well, perhaps right? Maybe, I, 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 I'm, but I, I'm using it for both. I'm using it for the case where I have multiple inline copies of the abstract instance, and I'm using it for the case where I don't. Or like when I just annotate a, a global declaration, I don't have multiple copies of that, right? Yeah. yeah. So in the end, I, I guess some, some extensions would be nice to have, but uh, emitting, a, em, em, emitting, yeah. So emitting dwarf that old GDB consumers can consume just fine is also important. Yeah, but we. Yeah. I, I, I need we. I need we need we need to play with an actual implementation to see how it works. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. So. I would, I would really, really like to put this into GCC 7 in some way, so we can start doing the stripping of type and whatever uh, for the next GCC. So what is remaining? Uh, mainly, mainly my simple object hack to make all this work with some older tooling that doesn't have the not yet existing uh, linker plugin extension. Uh, it needs to be implemented also for COF and MACHO. I need a volunteer for MACHO. Okay, so uh, LTO debug is no longer possible for uh, MachO then. <laughs> 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 um, then uh, I, I'm, I'm not very proud of most of the dwarf to our changes because it basically adds, if we are in LTO, then don't do this. But we have a lot of this stuff already. Yeah, this, this, uh, otherwise, I, otherwise, well, otherwise I wouldn't need uh, reviewers. I would just check it in, right? <laughs> So I want to see a second opinion of maybe somebody knows the code base, like Jason, and, and knows a better way of doing it. Because I, yeah. And, well, I just try it on how it behaves before and after. It's probably not a very good experience with LTO anyway, or on ADA. I, so I only looked at C and C++ at the moment to make sure we don't really regress in important ways and improve in some Im more important ways. <coughs> so there are some regressions and I opened GDB uh, bugs for some of them which I think are caused by just consumer issues. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, also so the, the, the GDB test suite is, is clean with patching, but they also don't have any LTO test cases. So thanks for listening, and if you have more questions on this one, then just we can talk offline.